Welcome. Uh, it's good to see so many friends here, or those who have heckled me over the years. Um, a number of your friends have traveled literally around the world with me, and you know who you are, um, in the pursuit of genealogy. But it's worth saying that uh, since uh, 1994, when I first began to have an uh, academic duel with my then undergraduate supervisor, Aubrey Newman, and subsequently since, when many friends in the room, Saul and Arlene, who were here, were there at the beginning in 1998, when I began this research, I quickly was aware as an academic, to develop a career, you need to consult learned researchers, and many of them are in the room, who along the way heckled me, tested me, or said, go on then Einstein, where did my family come from? So the key part of where I came from was really the poor Jews temporary shelter, not too far from here, in the east end of London. And so if there's anything in here that you don't quite know, you don't quite understand, heckle at the end, uh, harangue me later, or drop me an email, okay? I'm more than happy to answer questions from any of you, as long as you're not who do you think you are, who want you to do incredibly large amounts for nothing, okay? <laughs> okay, for those of you in the room, I pre presume most of you are lit vac. If you're not a lit vac, and you want to admit that, then let me know later on and uh, be brave out there. It's a strange world. It's odd what happens with research. The other week, Ancestry told me I was Jewish. Then I was it was updated a few weeks later, and I was not Jewish, which was a relief to my family because they couldn't quite understand whether, what the equivalent of a Jewish milkman was in our ancestry. But at some point, Ancestry did say I was 5% uh, Eastern European Jewish. Did I know where that was? And I thought, it's strange that. Does everybody know where we come from? The main talk really I want to talk about is how over the years um, have I gained insights into migration for my PhD and then my career, and how can that help you as genealogists? Particularly, I want to look at maritime records, which continue to change. So the, um, the first one of those, the Purdue Temporary Shelter Records, which I began my career with, became almost inaccessible until Saul started berating people the other week. So how can we find those? Secondly, what maritime records are available, they changed this month, and so more information is available, and I wanted to share that with you. And then thirdly, what can we analyze, what can we discern if we look at genealogy records in aggregate to see the overall bigger picture? The important start, really, is the archival legacies of the uh, philanthropy. And this is where I began. Over the years, the one thing that's become aware is very few shelter records other than those in London have emerged. One willing volunteer did go over to look at the Dutch Montefiore Verenigen. Again, little records have become a, a, apparent. And now that the Dutch archivists can even understand whole English, they were able to say, we can't find anything that's of genealogical relevance. But what has become more aware to me over the time is how interconnected these shelters were. There was a, a shelter which we never knew anything about in a place called Libau, L-I-B-A-U, in Latvia, which I was only aware of uh, partly through the delights of eBay when I bought something the other week. But in addition, the main point is where they provide for genealogists an inc incredibly rich resource of genealogical records here in Hull. Sorry, here in London, but also concerning those coming through Hull and Grimsby for a limited time. The main thing I would say is that although the uh, poor Jewish temporary shelter records have been digitized, I'll discuss those in a minute, there are additional ones. In an era before data protection, we were allowed to look at anything, so back in the 1990s. These days, data protection has actually hampered genealogical research, and you can now only look at records over 100 years old. But there are more records in the London Metropolitan Archives than have been included online in the poor Jewish temporary shelter records. That I will be hopefully uh, fin updating those in a few years' time. Searching for individual lit vacs, however, remains problematic. The record is weak. The gap remains larger than ever. Ancestry and all these great databases have made it possible to find everybody online. Indeed, somebody in the audience who wrote to me the other week, Maureen, has now came today to show me the records she could find. So when, when and if you do find your ancestors on on Ancestry, then get in touch with me, because I can then fill in the blanks. What I can't do is magic up um, um, imaginary journeys if they're not on any record. 
The Paul Dews Temporary Shelter Records, as many of you uh, in the room uh, know, have a fantastic resource. They still remain to this day uh, problematic. And if we've got Lee, is there a pointer on this? It's the which one? Middle one? Okay, and if you still hear, you, what the main issue is the phonetic transcription of information gathered by people at the time. Schwartz may not have been spelt like this. Manelovitz would certainly not have been spelt like this. Kovner varies with, with a, a, a K-O-W, K-O-V, or K-O-V-N-A, or K-O-V-N-O. And then, of course, we've got famously this vessel, which I've discussed previously. Information is inaccessible often because of paleography. So just to check that you're all awake, what is the name of the vessel coming from Libau in Russia? Okay, so squint. Everybody's quite quick to pick on ancestry. I'm the lead proponent of that, criticizing their, uh, often their prisoners who are transcribing information incorrect for us. But if we look at it, what was the name of the vessel that brought somebody to London? Anybody heckling the room who can remember this? Or were you asleep the last time you've heard this? Okay, anybody want to guess? This is what undergraduate enslaved workers, I'm a liberated one, um, used to have to do for Aubrey Newman at the University of Leicester as part of our degree. Okay, so it's a key point of why it's challenging to trace our ancestors. This says, as is very clear to anybody in the room, the Romeo brought was the name of the vessel that brought people from Latvia to London. Uh, to Hayes Galleria back in 1910. You can see the challenge of paleography, and it remains problematic today. The records of the Poor Jews Temporary Shelter document immigration into Britain, immigration through Hull, immigration through Grimsby, through Harwich, and to uh, obviously through London. But they are particularly rich. Many of them, as Saul Isroff has demonstrated, describe that great Jewish migration, the trek and schlep to, through, and from London on the way to South Africa, here to, on the Tintagel Castle. But the records are still worth checking because the information, as you have seen, is so easy to misunderstand and to transcribe uh, incorrectly. Yet the finding the Poor Jews Temporary Shelter Records has become a challenge. It's as if people thought, okay, everybody's content out there, we know how to find the records, let's start again, let's test them. And Saul and I certainly have been ones who've led the way of going, actually, we can't find what we know is there, uh, if you excuse my poor English there. And so what you need to do is go to the Kaplan Center Records. Okay, hands up in the room if you've gone to the Kaplan Center Records and cannot find what you know is there from the Poor Jews Temporary Shelter Records. Only three of you so far. Four of you, okay, it's like an auction. Five, it's going up. Okay, so by the end, we'll go. We all really did, but we just didn't want to put our hands up before. So what do you have to do? Just ask for divine intervention, it's a lot quicker because I just give up, basically. No, I'm only joking. What you basically do is go through this uh, search for the Kaplan Center. They've now got a snazzy picture. Um, and then you go for the Poor Jews Temporary Shelter record, or you Google it. You then go through this, this, get this lovely date. What you do not then do is what you think you should do, okay? So I'm not on drugs at this point. Do not put your name in there. Okay, you need to go through this, if you're following this, uh, click on that little box there, and it will allow you to restrict the access to just the poor Jews temporary shelter. South Africa, because they fund this, think you're only bothered about people going to South Africa when they forget about God's own country, England. Okay, so then you need to put in the information through here, and then you can search, either using the sound decks, which most of you will be familiar with, but look through this database, then look through this subset and search for a name. The information then becomes familiar, as many of us over the years are familiar with. So at last, we're nearly there. Notice here I've put in a very easy to find name rather than something like many of your family names may have been uh, from Schwartz or Cohen or Levy. And so particularly the one which was going from here, I know in advance because I worked from the records another way. And you can then click on this information. It then gives you a plethora of information, including Kovno. But note here, on this long list of detail, nobody has attempted to tell us how they got to England. Okay? So this immediately shows us how some of the transcribed information is either problematic or just not there. 
And so what you find are the original records continue to have more information than is available in this database. And if you can, through some psychotic experience, manage to get into this database online, thank God it's for free, then what you'll find is information on the, the Jewish journey. Okay, so have a look around it and certainly don't go through the general uh, database here. All right. Second, once you know of how somebody came through, and I know most of you in the room will be going, that's great, what about me? I can never find anybody. Then you can search through other information. The, the Jewish Chronicle, which my spell check didn't clearly identify sufficiently here, <laughs> uh, shows what happens when you're, uh, when you're uh, uh, in a rush. If Aubrey Newman was here, he'd tell you what happens with Nick's incapable spelling. Then what you find is the Jewish Chronicle rarely has information. It has other information that people like Jeanette have told us about over the years. But other information, the Times, and crucially, the British Library newspapers are then helpful. How? They don't give us the list of ancestors. So before you all rush for the door demanding a refund, what I'm talking about today is how you find the stories of your ancestral journeys once you know there is a record with their name on them. Through Find My Past, they are increasingly digitizing regional newspapers, exotic places, Dundee, Harwich, Hull. God, you imagine those sunshine destinations. <laughs> what they recorded was what was interesting to them, maritime information. And whichever vessel your ancestors were on, they will tell you when did it sail from a particular port and when did it arrive in a particular place. But remember, use uh, Find My Past. Now, if you're using Find My Past, don't put your ancestor's name in it. Sounds really odd for a genealogy website, but they deliberately think you're completely and utterly suffering a thick nick experience. Therefore, use the free search box and search for what you can find. If you go particularly through here, this, which looks familiar to many of you who can afford their expensive uh, database searches, you can find through here newspapers, and then don't search for your first name and your surname, which most of us would do. Search under the free word, or they call it keyword searching. Through this, I know my granddad had a tra transport conviction uh, for cy cycling through Hull without his lights on in the 1930s. I know that my great uncle drove uh, over the limit but was let off in the 1930s because he was an experienced driver and therefore could control his drink. And you can find out a plethora <laughs> of information about these journeys. Yet for migration, for thinking oh, he's got off the record. For migration, you can search for the name of vessels your ancestors sailed on. Or you can search for the ports if you know where they went through. So, when you're looking through it, to restrict or help you make a speedier quick search, look through the newspaper, so I'll just flick back. You can go through on here by newspaper. If you look through and go under L, Many of you may have lost the track by this point, but just if you want to Google list it or Google search it, you can find Lloyd's List. Does that make sense to everybody? Lloyd's List. So why am I on about this? This is one of these sources which you used to have to go to the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich to look at. I've dragged Saul out there over the years. We've all got sunburnt in sunny Greenwich. Um, but what you can find, if you research, restrict your access through Lloyd's List and then apply the filter there, it will only search through Lloyd's List. If we then put in the Romeo, Thank God there were not many romantic people at the time. If you put through the Romeo, we then will know, and we know that they travelled in 1909, it will then tell us what's going on. Now, if you look at the top number here, 42, there were 42 newspaper entry references describing uh, the movement of that vessel in that period you know your ancestor went through. And so we know that the Romeo, travelling from Riga, was part of the Wilson line. So you can then look for their archives. We know that it would arrive um, in by August the 27th, 1909. We know exactly uh, when it would arrive and where it would travel through. We know it was a steamship. We know the captain was William Colbeck. We even know it landed here at Hare's Wharf. And the tra passengers were travelling on the United Shipping Company's uh, lines. So from these records, 
what we are able to discern is a plethora of additional information complementing the records of the people appearing in the poor Jews temporary shelter of London. Thus, we know that the Romeo sailed from Riga, um, or sailed from Riga first, and then called into Libau. We know the exact date it arrived in Libau, L-I-B-A-U, now known as Liepeia, a key emigrant port on the west coast of Latvia, uh, at the time Imperial Russia, and that it set sail. We then know, through a subsequent uh, uh, entry in the Lloyds list, two days later, when it arrived at Gravesend, near London, hurrah! This is a relevant person. And if we look down here, we know the Romeo arrived. We know the exact date, because they've got the date here of the newspaper. But also, you've got the date of arrival here. And it was bound for Hayes Wharf, or as most of you know it today, Hayes Galleria, the larder of London. Crucially, while searching for this lot, this cropped up, and I didn't know it, I did it the other day. We have all these regular steam shipping operations with the United Shipping Company, all the way to and from London. They go to Millwall Dock or uh, Canary Wharf, but they actually would sail all the way over to um, the centre of London to discharge their passengers. So these digital records are continually becoming available. Genealogists fail to engage with these as much as they could do unless they're involved with who do you think you are and this is what we use on television to show somebody when they arrive and they hope they will cry to camera. In, in, <laughs> invariably, few people ever will or if they do, they're a bit weird as my mother would call them if they did cry on camera about they want an ancestor from so long ago. So who else is registered or digitised? Unbeknown to me, till a friend called Mark uh, contacted me last month, and a pan called Charles Van Onselen, who Saul and I know well, uh, contacted me uh, in July, the crew lists have finally become digitised as well. So what am I saying? If your ancestor didn't appear in an ancestry record of the people who migrated through Hamburg, then one of the options you can look at are philanthropic records. If they are, they predominantly document arrivals in London. If you're fortunate enough to do that, we can now get a lot more information. We know when they left Libau. We know the route they took along the Baltic. We know when they passed through the uh, Kiel Canal. We know when they arrived at Gravesend. We know when the, where they arrived in London, Hayes Wharf. We know where they then went to, the short walk past the Tower of London to the Poor Jews Temporary Shelter. And we now can work out who were the crew to. And this new website, here, if you just Google uh, Memorial University Canada, now have did, uh, the ability, if you pay in gold, I put here, I'd suggest your full arm, because you're dealing with a huge cost, then you can now get copies or digital copies of these information. To get the crew lists, if you know your ancestor was a mariner and they were Jewish, you know the voyage of an ancestor and therefore want to know more of the information, you can pay for them. They give you a £100 minimum charge. I thought that was the cost. I was clearly having a thickening moment. My lot cost me something like 250 quid, which my wife knows when she checks my credit card bills as to what I've been spending my salary on this month. So what you can do is these people in Canada can digitise records concerning Britain. Now, in case anyone in the room is thinking, what's he on about? Britain gave away her archives of the Merchant Marine um, a few a decades ago, and they went to Canada. Don't ask why. And therefore, rather than destroying them, they gave them to Canada, and that's where they're now held. So if I then looked, I realize you can't all read this, you can get digital copies which you can search freely of these crew lists. So I now know when this vessel, the Romeo, arrived. You won't be able to see on the top, but there's a chap who's in charge called William Colbeck. Has anyone heard of him? Mentioned, mentioned him, yeah. So I've mentioned him already. I'm glad Saul's listening. Uh, you, you've got uh, mentioned him already. William Colbeck was one of the most famous explorers of the time. Okay? So all of a sudden, what we now know about this Jewish migrant journey coming to London is not only where the vessel went to, but also something about the experienced mariner. 
he could sail along the Baltic. This was crucial, providing Russian Jews with an emigrant route through Russia to Britain enabled hundreds of thousands of Jews to leave. But it was a dangerous route. How better to get than somebody who'd gone to rescue Captain Scott from the Arctic in 1900. He was in his spare time transporting Jews from Russia to England. We know at the top here, Captain Scott, sorry, um, Captain Colbeck. Interestingly, along the way, you can then find all the different individuals who were also alongside him. We know for a fact that if you see here, a five-year-old son of Captain Colbeck was the cabin boy, who was even put on the payroll by his infamous dad to give him an experience. What experience can you have taken to the Arctic? No, not quite today, son. Taken to the polar regions? No, maybe in the future. Go to Latvia to get some Jews? Go on then, dad. I'll come with you. And so this uh, son, who became equally famous, he also received the gold medal from the Royal Geographic Society for his voyages, sailed with his father, with Jews who were coming through uh, Libau all the way to London. And to give you a picture, here he is with one of his images. Here's the vessel, looks quite posh. Not everybody was brought on these terrible journeys that I've talk talked about before. By 1905, by the Aliens Act, by Britain uh, restricting immigration of Jews to Britain, the conditions went up and they improved. And this vessel, the Romeo, was a very fine, posh one. A bit pre-Titanic era, if your ancestors were one here and hit an iceberg or something equivalent in the, in the category, they wouldn't have been able to get on one of these. They'd not paid enough, they would have died. And so they would have been under this tween deck area. And here, in the private logbooks of the captain, we know he went from Riga to Libau and then to London. All the information we've got from the newspapers, but also at the bottom here, he took in, uh, in his vessel, the Romeo bound for London, uh, 20 tons of pork, 34 five horses, and 41 emigrants, of whom 26 were adults, uh, nine were uh, single, and then eight were children. Okay. So we now know nearly everything there possibly is to know. So why do these facts matter? From the crew lists, we know there was somebody on board the vessel who could speak to Jews in a language they would be familiar with, William Hennig of Königsberg. He'd previously resided in the east end of London, but he'd signed up in the Poplar Merchant Marine Office. He was a ship's carpenter, but spoke German, and he was born in Breslau. We also know that by this point, conditions had improved. A lady called Rowena Witten, a nurse uh, who had previously been born on the commercial road in the east end of London, the Jewish heartland of Britain, had actually uh, been a medically trained individual who could help. So we're now getting nearly every single bit of information we possibly can about this journey. So if you too want to find out crew lists, here are some points of advice. First, there are the free ones. Unlike the Porteous Temporary Shelf Records, they're as easy as they come to search. This is free, it's online, and you don't need an ancestry or find my past gold bullion costing account. Just Google 1915 crew lists. And as part of the centenary of the end of the First World War, the National Maritime Museum digitized her 10% sample, which she has. Remember, you need gold for this, for the ones in Canada, but there are some freebies. So if you have got an emigrant voyage from 1881 only, then these are available. And they include Jews as well as non-Jews. So if you're thinking, this is a Jewish genealogy event, Nick, then there were people named Daniel Cohen, a cook from Warsaw who was on the SS Mini. Okay, so we have lots of different individuals. These stories, these sources, help us contextualize the information. So what is the bigger picture? We often look at the micro. Here I've looked, flogged you to death with a story of a one vessel, and you might all be thinking, but that wasn't the one I was looking for. 
The bigger picture is over time, through these uh, two decades now of research, through lots of your help on Jugen, from queries to uh, uh, Jewish genealogy sites, we now know the story of Jewish migration from start to finish. Jews, we know, would travel through the heart of Imperial Russia on train. We, I'll show you how to work out which train in a moment. We know that they would have arrived in Libau. Look at the trains there, but look at the primitive wooden trains they would have traveled on. They would have then gone past a police check the day before this vessel disembarked from anywhere in Russia. They would have emptied everybody off the vessel and then brought on all the humans and made sure they appear in a crew list, in a logbook, or in a passenger record, which we know through genealogy already have been destroyed at the time. They would then embark along the Kattegat, and they would then travel. Recently, we also know uh, just how or who transported them out of Libau. So Libau is this place, L-I-B-A-U, which is a port in Imperial Russia. And from 1900 to 1906, when the data is very good, we know who they bought shipping options with, how they left. And these are the three companies that they would be able to buy tickets for within Libau. So we've got a big, if notice the German growth of here, a German Jew, and also some transoceanic ones. The destinations of the passengers were not always England. We get some here. I've got to include South Africa, just so Saul doesn't hit me later. Um, but we've also got South America, which is a Jewish destination. And, of course, North America being the predominant one. And so these ECA records from the um, uh, Jewish Colonization Association tell us more information about these different options of people at the time. ECA records also tell us precise information about the movement of people to and through this one port called Libau. He says of the trains which came from it, the Ukraine, Romney in the south. The train arrives in the middle of the night at one o'clock or eight in the morning. Employees of the company meet them there and assign them to proper people. In other words, Jewish lodging house keepers. They are put onto cars, that's horse-drawn trams, and driven to the houses of emigrants. An old employee plays the first part of the process. He disposes of the emigrants to his liking. If he doesn't like you, you don't get good lodgings. But all of this business is under Jewish control. He is Jewish, the agent places he's taken to are Jewish, and therefore it's a Jewish-controlled enterprise. Most of the houses are small. They only have four or five rooms. They're built of wood, have straw mattresses, and a pillow made of kelp. Sheets and blanket, they're generous. They provide those too. So now we've got a precise information. And if you want to know what Latvia at the time looked at, visit there now, because very little of it has changed. Or well, certainly in terms of some of the emigrant areas, you've still got wooden houses. You still can see most of those things. Okay. Mr. Yudovich's emigrant home is one particular example that he visited. And landlords go themselves to the train stations with the policemen, called gendarmes. It's confusing. Why would you have a French name for the police in Imperial Russia? I don't know about that. But anyway, uh, you don't ask a whole man about language. And then you've got these employees. And so what they do, what do we know? They filled up these houses. They clearly preferred to fill up their friends' houses first. If a large containment of Jews come, they continue to expand them. The rooms, though, are dirty. The walls are striped, in other words, with wallpaper. The beds are huddled together. The linen is more of doubtful whiteness. In other words, they're not really washed. Above all, the house, it hardly ever lacks of emigrants. So despite the diabolical conditions in which the Jews were transported, when they got to La uh, Libau, the Jews of Latvia, as we would now call them, the Jews, of course, of Imperial Russia at the time, didn't look after their kith and kin very well. And Ica is describing this, a Jewish charity at the time. Everything is interconnected. The sun works out of one of the shipping offices. The whole business is monopolized. If you think it's bad, then you look at who is actually providing the op operation. 
Here's one we prepared earlier. This is the view from the railway bridge at Libau. Now, I think certainly Arlene and Saul in the room have been here. You can now walk the route. Thankfully, because my father-in-law was obsessed with everything Latvian and became an honorary Latvian ambassador, in the words of one of my friends, Henry, he photographed everything. And when we found these ECA reports latterly, he'd photographed absolutely everywhere we needed. So what I would say to you is, hire a Japanese tourist from my, my in-laws uh, there, and they will photograph everything for you. Okay. But it's a useful tip. Photograph the lot, because you're probably not going to go back there later. So I told you about digitized travel guides. They don't include everybody. But the 1913 Bradshaws, thanks to, thanks to a former cabinet minister who is traveling around Europe, are now available on Ancestry pretty cheaply. For anyone who is an experienced researcher and has gone to the British Library, good for you. If you're going again, I'll give you other copies I want you to look through. But for me, I could buy this mammoth of a book for a cheap price. It then tells you of the very few train journeys people took to get from one side of Russia to the next. This one covers from Vilna to Romney. Most of you will want the other way around, from Romney in the Ukraine all the way up to Vilna. I'm assuming most of you have heard of Vilna. If not, if you're a pure Litvak, there's a Kovno equivalent. Okay. And then from, Libau, from Vilna, sorry, you go all the way up to Libau. So what we know, if you're going from the Ukraine, you set off at 2.27 in the morning, a hell of a long journey later, you go through Minsk to Vilna, and then the next, the next day, you can travel all the way to Libau. We know already these are diabolical conditions of trains, no toilets, a, 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 a water, a bucket to wee in, um, and to get rid of that when you can. But look at all the places they travel through. Many of them will be familiar places to you. The rail routes through uh, Imperial Russia are some of these largest Jewish cities. And so these freight trains take Jewish emigrants along them all the way to uh, Libau. So we now know of these Jews who arrive at Hayeswarf, all the journey all the way back to Latvia and all the way back to the Gabern or to the nearest town, whether it's Kiev, whether it's Minsk, whether it's Vilna, where they came from. There were other magnets that they would go to as well. Many were coming to Britain, immigrants. Lots more were transients en route to South Africa. All of these are now largely available through digitized records, especially Ellis Island. But the bigger picture is quite discerning. Again, through analyzing the macro uh, information available on the poor Jews temporary shelter, we know that most of these Litvaks were going from what we now call a translocal migration, a movement from one locality, Kaunas or Kovno Gabernia, to another area, predominantly South Africa in this case, but also other parts of the world too. But just look how large, how concentrated this movement was and how few people coming through London came from these smaller areas. Okay, you can read it through the uh, Good Library or uh, see that online or heckle. Okay. We know in transit now Jews kept their religion up. This was something that's written out of the history and something that's rarely available in the records. And Saul kindly located this image from me of Litvaks emerging, uh, arriving in South Africa, maintaining a minion in transit. And so we, what we know is that many captains like Holbeck and like Smith, who was on the Titanic, and all these other mariners who you've never heard of were tolerant to Jews particularly with last night's news, it's welcoming to know that many of the uh, captains of any fleet were tolerant of religion. Why? It kept things ordered and made their life easier because as long as you were observant, you were not drunk, were not heckling, and were not interfering with the crew. Crucially, though, if you can't find people in records here, you can sometimes find more information out there. And in the terms of just Latvian Jews who were naturalized in the Cape Colony, particularly relevant to the lady on the front row, you, we know that the earliest Latvians arrived in South Africa 
from 1885 and sought naturalization between 1900 and 1905. Here, though, what we know is these naturalization records reveal just where everybody came from. A particular uh, generic term, Corland, an area around modern Latvia, uh, but also Libau, uh, Goldingen, Hassenport, um, and, of course, Riga. What's important from this story is it negates the significance of Riga. The reason why you've all probably heard of migration for Riga is because many Anglo-Jewish historians in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s wrote about Riga, but they didn't realize nobody really came through it. Very few Jews come through Riga. Instead, they go through Libau and then over into Britain. The occupations also shows Jews were not all peddlers all ta or tailors. This shows you just what the occupations were of Jews in South Africa. And I include this because I know it's not Britain, and I know you're all going to heckle me because it isn't London. But it shows you the occupations of Jews in Russia were a lot more diverse than we think. <coughs> this aggregate information, which doesn't give you your ancestor's surname or forename or when they had a bar mitzvah, does though tell you the type of occupations Jews of Imperial Russia who decide to migrate had. They show barman, baker, cigarette maker, handy for the Jews who then go through London to Glasgow. Dairyman, dental surgeon, electroplater, uh, plumber, hotel keeper, hawker, painter, glazier, all of these diverse occupations. Jews were not what we read in the literature, especially at the time of the 1905 Royal Commission, limited to a few occupations. They were a lot more multi-skilled than we imagine. Many also came back. We forget this. A Jewish person I'm looking at at the minute for Charles von Onselen traveled 26 times in his life. Admittedly, that's a bit atypical, but now the passenger records from 1890 to 1960 are digitized. We know all of these journeys back, and particularly when people are observing uh, the death of a loved one back home in the era of telegraph. People travel back to Russia in order to uh, say the prayers in the aftermath of a Jewish loss of a Jewish loved one. The records of those coming in on Ancestry are as relevant as those going out on Find My Past. And here, if we get a particular example, uh, we have Max Post, uh, Postel, um, a first class. He was traveling, so he'd done well, a physician, and he traveled to Epsom in Surrey. Not everybody was going to the Pale. Saul, for this, you'll know his daughter, Postal, Debbie. And so uh, we see that lots of people were going. Lots of those who were coming back showed their wealth and attainment in the promised land, whether that's America, Canada, or South Africa, by traveling cabin class or first class. In the case of Henry Bloomberg, who many of you will know through the Latvia SIG, his, his family had previously stayed at a hotel in London. Not a shabby one, it's called the Dorchester. Okay, and Henry didn't quite know what that meant till I said, God, they had money. <laughs> to conclude, okay, I realize this is a rambling, but there's lots of slides, and there'll be a million and one heckles. Anecdotal evidence is often dismissed. Keep the lot, write it down, okay? Secondly, trying to differentiate between myth and reality is problematic. The myths are often better stories than the reality. So keep them in. It's what will keep the family entertained and interested in your story when you're obsessed with it and they're rolling their eyes. If you're fortunate enough to have a documented ancestral movement, see how it differs from the historians. Migrant historians lie. I'll tell you that as one, OK? Do not believe a word that comes out of my mouth. That's what I tell all students. <laughs> Do not believe a word that comes out of anybody for, before me. All those rich, powerful professors from Oxford and Harvard and Yale, liars, full lot of them. <laughs> Till you've seen your own ancestors' journey from the Latvia or Lithuania to Britain and South Africa or America or even glorious counties like Yorkshire, find the stories that you can. If you query anything, you get along the journey and think that's an odd place, 
Get in touch with me. That's when you get your payback and heckle me. I can't give you documents with your ancestors' names on. What I can do, though, is interpret them and tell you every single story. From the minute, or should we say it, the hour they left from the pale, to the hour they left Russia, to the quarter of an hour they arrived in Britain, and to the 10 minutes they would have got at the railway station from. I will fill in the blanks, but I can't magic up mystery. I can only add to the story that you will hopefully embellish and make far more important than my own. Thank you. Okay, so it's now time for you to heckle, to throw tomatoes, to ask. I couldn't understand a word of that because you've got a northern accent, okay? That was riveting, Nick. Thank you. I'm afraid I'm one of those that is not a Litvak. Oh, shame on um, you. And, um, Own up. Go on. Go on. You can do it. My ancestors reached South Africa in 1820. Okay. My Jewish ancestors. So um, what I am interested to know from you particularly is how my Polish grandparents, who spent two years in Berlin between Łódź and London, how they would have travelled around 1906-07 from Berlin to London. I've never been able to track them in 20 years of looking. Berlin to London. So firstly, they're in Berlin, so they're posh. Second question. So, we've got two. Excuse okay, me. that's good. Um, My memory may not last, but are, go on. Are we able to get copies of your slides? I couldn't write fast enough. You can do. Just get in touch with me and shout abuse, and I'll send you it. Okay. Be good. Thanks. So on Berlin. Berlin's easier. Berlin to Hamburg, uh, Hamburg to London, um, or Berlin to Bremen, Bremen to London. Okay? If it's the first one, Hamburg, they're on Ancestry. If it's the second one, they went through uh, Bremen and they're, they're not on Ancestry. So therefore, you won't ever find them on a record. Hey, uh, if they were from Berlin, they were probably not poor, or that poor, so therefore, they won't appear in the poor Jews temporary shelter records. But have a look through them. Look through the uh, registers, if you know the detail, of the, uh, um, particularly, rather than the transcriptions, because I never trust the transcriptions, partly because I was involved with transcribing them as an undergraduate. Okay, so, um, so, so look at that one. Um, but also email me the 1820 ancestor, because I'm interested in that as well. Oh, you, well, yeah, but I don't, so that's for you. You're being greedy, I tell you. Okay, more heckles. Uh, two questions. Uh, I'm trying to trace an ancestor who left Germany, a little village called Schwarzenau, uh, and in 1938 and ended up in Bogota in Colombia. And I have found absolutely nothing. Have you any ideas? Mm, good question. Advantage for you there, because it's near the Second World War, so some of the Bremen records have survived. I'm not sure what's going on with the Hamburg records at that time. Uh, many of them will not be transcribed, but may have survived. So check on the information at the time. The key thing really was if they got the, how they got there. So what I would do is I'd backtrack it. I would use the uh, newspaper records I've, I've mentioned, Lloyd's, Go to whatever the ports were um, in, in South America that you mentioned, the nearest one, and see how you can physically transport anything from Germany to there or from Britain to there. I'll give you a clue. There'll be very few options, and that will help you home, home the, way, the route through. Unless you can transport freight along that route, you won't take passengers. And if at that time, because of the number of refugees traveling, there would be a very discernible number of people traveling, um, including, as we've seen, who do you think you are recently, with Tony Kushner, someone who flew out of Germany just to escape. So there are lots of different unusual routes for that period, but the records will be, there, um, will, will be um, I think, there. But the key thing is look through the newspapers first, and they'll highlight the possible routes that they could have traveled along, and then check for those ports in question, both from the continent, from Germany, but especially through uh, perhaps Holland, or especially through Britain, as to how they could have got out. Okay, my second question actually is for an ancestor who left Holland in the mid-19th century okay. and disappeared. I haven't been able to trace where he went. Yeah, very hard, basically. Um, and you, uh, for that earlier period, the, the paucity of the record means there's very little that survived. So unless they appear on a census somewhere, then I don't know how you're going to find them, basically. 
So good luck with that one. It's one of those things where you just don't necessarily know where things happen. I know certainly for my family through the mid 18th century, we know they went to America and they recently turned upon something online. So it's amazing what records can surface over time, given that everything else has been digitized over the years. Okay, but, um, but good luck with that one. Okay. Can you suggest what port my great uncle could have travelled from, from Guppingham to London, right just before 1900, 1890 something? 1890. So where was it in, in Europe? Guppingham, in Germany. Okay, in Germany. Most of them, if it was pre-1892, they would have gone through Hamburg or Bremen. If it was post-1892, they would have gone from, um, to London. They would have travelled through, uh, probably through Bremen, Bremerhaven, um, over from there direct. You could also travel, so you could go through uh, Bremerhaven to London, you could go from uh, Holland uh, to London, and you could go from Antwerp to London, or you could go through Hull and Grimsby and then further south, okay? 1892 changed the full world, okay? 1892, a cholera broke out, Jews were blamed for that, so there was a growth of anti Semitism. But when, when the trade was restored after cholera epidemic 1892 to 1894, Jews were controlled, or most Euro European migrants controlled, of whom most were Jewish. Their journeys were controlled in particular through certain routes or routes, um, and they would go through, uh, if they went through Germany, they had to travel on a German shipping company. Um, and if they went, they would increasingly go, avoid Germany though, and go through uh, Imperial Russia, and go through Libau. So the Jew, Jew, Jewish migration through Libau to uh, London grows from a very uh, irrelevant handful of people pre-1892 to 4,000 a year uh, by 1896. And so it's a huge, huge route. And 115,000 Jews travel from that route to Britain. So it's a huge thing. Sad thing is the genealogy record for that route doesn't really exist. And so you, you're back to square one. You want to find the name of your ancestor. And that's what we all want to find. Okay, they're coming to attack me by far now. No, I'm not going to attack you, Nick, but uh, I think David Jacobs will remember. He and I were at a conference in Jerusalem in 1984 where the work of Jürgen Seelemann was presented. Mm. Jürgen's retired now, but I think he's still around. But through Hamburg, all the, a lot of the shipping, and including passenger lists and so forth, Jürgen's team did, I'm not talking about digitizing, but the information was certainly collated. Um, I just caught on the hop because I thought your talk was supposed to be about Lithuania and Latvia, and now it seems to be diverted into Germany. I haven't got references immediately to hand, but I could research Jürgen's uh, details mm. and make them available yeah. in, uh, over the next few weeks. Well, the key, thing for Jürgen, the key thing for Jürgen's was, and I sit concerned, uh, Jeanette will have a lot more knowledge on, than me on German Jewry, but the, um, in terms of Jürgen's work, it's been uh, taken over by Ancestry, who've, who've bought everything. The key thing I found, though, and people may correct me, uh, was that if you have the free Ancestry at the local library, that doesn't always have all the records on. It's the, the one you've got to pay for yourself, which does, and that concerns Germany. So the, the uh, German emigrant record, uh, which Anthony mentions, which uh, Herr Zielmann uh, was responsible for digitizing at the Hamburg State Archives, has two types of migrants, okay? They are emigrants. They are going to America direct from, uh, ha from Hamburg from 1854, sorry, 1850 onwards, from 1854 onwards, indirect, but spelt with a K rather than a C, uh, so it's the German version, and they are the ones you're wanting, which take you to uh, migrants who would travel to Leith, to New Haven, to Hull, to uh, Grimsby, to New Haven, to West Hartlepool, to Hartlepool, to London, um, up to 1914, okay? Most of them haven't yet been transcribed, they have been digitized. So what you then need to do is look through the year and need to look through the old lists, which Herr Zielmann used to mention. You used to have to go through these lists. I went there and I bought 200 pounds worth of digitization from the Hamburg State Archives. And it's the only time I've ever been thanked on behalf of the state of anywhere for my work. Um, thankfully, Saul had managed to get Cape Town to pay for that. And so therefore, I didn't have to pay them too much. But um, since then, Ancestry have digitized everything. Ancestry thus has most of the Hamburg records, which is handy for us, because large numbers of people traveled through Hamburg to London, Hamburg to Grimsby, Hamburg to Hull. But they haven't finished transcribing them all yet. 
So look through the original uh, year, or if you can't find somebody, and have a go at it yourself. I'll give you a clue. You'll see how hard it is to transcribe records, especially using German handwriting at that time. Okay. I have, I have a four-page biography of my grandfather who went to South Africa about 1860, having come to England via Memel and Gorse. Mm. He mentions his family there, but I don't know very much about what happened on the way. When he went to South Africa, he went on the Asiatic. Okay. But I'm interested to know the connections with Memel and Gorse and how they would have come here and how they would have lived, etc. Okay, so before Liebau, uh, Konigsberg and uh, Memel were uh, easier routes through which to get out of um, the Baltic. And so what I would say to you is because yours are so early, pre-1880, so Google online for a lady called Ruth Lezovitz. Um, if you email me, I'll give you her details. And she's got a lot of records of those Jews who move before 1880 through these borderlands, particularly through German ports, okay? Most but of my family came much earlier, and the Sephardi lot were here in the 17th century. Yeah, well, that's very early, and so, but drop me an email, and I'll, oh, I'll, 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 um, I'll give you some abuse on email, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to get harangued by people. I'm not in charge of the mic. Well, shout, go on then. <laughs> Yeah, well, they've got two routes. Uh, the, the Ukraine, the routes I've described today, I, I mentioned they're for Litvaks and Latvians. I'm not asking, I'm not, I, I was only uh, goading the audience for that. Lots of Ukrainian Jews would have gone on that route too. Well, yeah, Glitziana Jews would have done that too. Now, Glitziana, because of its proximity to the border, uh, there is another option of crossing the border there, which has been well documented by Anglo-Jewish historians. Um, and so you could go particularly crossing at a place called Brody, B-R-O-D-Y, um, and therefore get into uh, the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and then once you get over the border, you can go through um, Antwerp or through Rotterdam. Again, that's not helpful because the records are uh, equally problematic for immigrants coming through Antwerp or through uh, Rotterdam. And so um, some did go up to Hamburg, but it was lesser so for the Glitziana, and they would have traveled across there. But there were lots of different routes available. Okay, so uh, what I would do to you, say to you is email me uh, with the details you do, do have, then I will do my best as to give you a more informed um, answer but about those particular routes, okay? Um, Nicholas, uh, staying with the Ukraine, um, could you tell me the main routes from Odessa, please? Mm. Odessa, yeah. There are about 10 or maximum Jews coming from Odessa to London each year. Okay, so I think they maybe came on cargo vessels. Instead, going back to the previous lady's question, they would have, they would have traveled through uh, some routes, okay, overland um, into um, uh, Austria, Hungary, or into Germany. Now, if they're through Germany, obviously we all want them to go through Hamburg because they're then digitized. Um, but there are lots of different people through that from lots of different routes. There are too many from Odessa to give you a, a, a reasonable option. If they went from Odessa to Romney, which I mentioned in my lecture, they can sail all, travel on a train all the way to, uh, to Libau and then over to the UK. Okay, so that's another route. The problem for you is they'll be on undocumented routes, and most genealogists are looking for the passenger record with their ancestor, their name, and all of that. And that's the big problem with the Jewish migration, that actually um, we can only guess or make guesstimates from the macro information <coughs> rather than detail through passenger records those precise routes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't know where we're at now. Um. Okay. Sorry, I can't. I'm, I'm glad I'm not in charge of the microphone. Um, 
My ancestors were Litvats, and they came from Sewalki Lomza to either Leith or to Hull between 1865 and 1875. And they probably came by sailing ship mm. and not steamship because there's all sorts of stories that they were meant to go to the USA, but they were so seasick they never went any further. That's a common story. And I remember you telling me 10 years ago that you expected more records to come online for those coming by sailing ship to Leith or to Hull. So what I'm wondering is, is that true? Are there now more records online that one could search? Yeah, the records, uh, particularly those indirect lists, which I mentioned earlier for Hamburg, have now been digitized. They haven't been all transcribed yet. Uh, but um, if you think they arrived at Leith, then um, I just suggest you contact the Scottish Jewish Archives because they've, um, uh, they've tried to um, analyze the macro findings of those, those routes, and they may be able to give you some more information. Uh, arrival through God's own county, Hull, um, then the records have been digitized for the records which have survived before 1869, HO3, Home Office 3 uh, from the National Archives, but they're digitized now and they're um, on Ancestry. If they arrived in one of the earlier ones, HO2, Home Office 2, then they've been digitized on Ancestry 2. So have a look through those things. Most of them that are available are now, on, are, are now in some format online. Most of them are with the Ancestry family. But Jill, drop me an email and I'll point you to those if you couldn't understand any of that. And also on God's own um, county, um, my great uncle deposited his memoirs with Sheffield Library and they digitized them. So they've been an absolute boom because he went to South Africa on and off over a large number of years between the 1880s and up to the 1920s. And I do recommend anyone that finds out their relations have submitted a memoirs to public libraries. He's not the only one. Other relations submitted their memoirs to public libraries yeah. because I think they're really fantastic sources of information. Well, they're incredibly rich, as you said. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm afraid I think we only have time for one more question. And I'm going to go to this side and lady at the front. And I apologize, okay. but please uh, do catch uh, Nick uh, in the breaks at lunch. And I'm sure he'll be delighted to... Uh, help. Uh, hello. Um, for, on behalf of one of the very few Litvaks here, who always has to um, be heckled by all the other countries from which they came, I want to thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.